I have the dubious distinction of speaking right after lunch, so hopefully I will keep all of you awake. Uh, the first thing I want to do to make sure of that is just to take all your pictures. So if everybody could wave at me um, so I can make sure that we're all awake. Everybody give me a nice wave. Thank you. Perfect. All right, I will post that to my Instagram account, which just aged me because, yes, I still use Instagram. A um, lot, of, lot of feedback from the lights, but I'll try to make the picture as good as possible. I'd like to thank the uh, Dermatology Education Foundation for allowing me to give this talk today. Um, it's hopefully going to be an educational talk for you. I'm going to go over a lot of different companies and tests out there. Um, I will be available afterwards. I'll give you my email at the end uh, to, uh, if you do want to email me uh, to ask any questions. All right, so you can see my talk here. We're gonna talk about the uh, molecular tests for both diagnosis and treatment. These are my disclosures, and I think it's part and parcel to this discussion. Um, I do speak for Castle Biosciences, uh, and I will be talking about their tests today, uh, but I was asked to give this talk to discuss how I use uh, genomic expression profiling in my clinical practice, and at the end of this talk, you'll, we'll go over some of uh, the information of how I integrate this into how I manage patients. So you see this. The question is, patients come into your office with multiple different looking pigmented lesions. Are they, is it melanoma? Is it just a nevus? Does it need to be a biopsy? Do you need tissue diagnosis? Well, I think you would agree that the gold standard for obtaining a tissue uh, diagnosis is to perform a skin biopsy. And there are many ways to perform skin biopsies. I see them all. Um, I'm not sure which ones you do, but I would please say don't do the top three. Uh, they are not going to give any information that we can manage a patient with. Uh, I've highlighted the three that I think are the best ways to biopsy a lesion with the deep shade, the scallop, or saucerization, and those are kind of all synonymous. I think it's important because these get a little bit deeper into the tissue uh, where you can get the full thickness of the lesion as well as the edges. Uh, you can get the entire lesion. Uh, you may talk to some surgeons who want a punch biopsy. Punch biopsies are great because they do give you the full thickness, but it may not be representative of the entire lesion. So I'm very uh, adept at, or very um, accepting of uh, using these three types uh, of biopsies. But biopsies aren't a free pass. Uh, there are some downfalls of biopsies. They can be invasive for lots of patients. It causes scarring, uh, especially on the face or the, the hands. Um, and it's embarrassing if it's on the genitalia. It requires local anesthetic. Um, patients not only come with one pigmented lesion, but they can have multiple pigmented lesions. And now if you're biopsying four or five lesions on them, it's a hindrance to them because they have to heal up. But it's also a hindrance for you because you have to spend time doing it. And if you have two more patients in your clinic waiting for you to be seen because you're running an hour behind already and now you've got to biopsy five lesions on a patient, well, that's quite frustrating. It can be time consuming. Uh, there are bleeding and infection risks. You would hope your patient would be off anticoagulation. Um, if, you're, if you're doing deeper biopsies, they may bleed a little bit more, and you may not get the entire lesion. It's not uncommon to see uh, transected at the base when you get the pathology report. So can molecular diagnostic testing help? Well, initially we diagnose uh, if a patient needs a biopsy when you see them. You do the ABCDs and e, ABCDEs, you look at it and you say, yes, that's a lesion I need to biopsy. However, the vast majority of biopsies that you perform are going to be benign, and many of them are going to be indeterminate, where you don't get an answer if this is cancer or not. So can a diagnosis be made without an invasive biopsy? Can we use molecular or genomic expression to risk stratify tumors? And the answer is yes. Fortunately, genomic alterations occur early in melanoma formation. So you can pick these, uh, I, you can identify these alterations early to help assist with making a diagnosis. And not only having these, these alterations are important, but the lack of the alterations is also very informative because if the alterations are not there, then it's probably not going to be a malignancy. So there are two tests within this field I'm going to cover. The first one is uh, a test by Derm Tech, which is the pigmented lesion assay or the PLA, uh, and then MyPath DIFDX by Castle Biosciences. Uh, both of these companies do have booths uh, in the uh, in the industry section, so you can, if I haven't answered any of your questions completely, you can talk to them afterwards. So the DermTech, or the, the pigmented lesion assay, it's a two gene expression profile test. Their motto is a better way to find melanoma early. Uh, the reason that's important is because only three to four percent of biopsies that you perform on pigmented lesions are going to be positive for melanoma. So you need to do 27 biopsies to find one melanoma. So we're vastly over-treating for the risk of malignancy. Well, this 
test actually uses a non-invasive pigmented, I'm sorry, a non-invasive adhesive test that evaluates these pigmented lesions. It elevates the skin cells containing genomic tissue, and it tests for the presence of two genomic markers associated with melanoma, and those are link and prame. They also have a third uh, DNA marker that they would look at called TERT, but that's only present in about 30% of cases. The absence of these markers has a greater than 99% negative predictive value. So if you perform this test and they don't have either the link or the prime uh, alterations, then you can with good confidence say that this is not a melanoma and doesn't need any further treatment. The presence of these markers does require a tissue diagnosis, however, and a biopsy does need to be performed. However, in the vast majority of these lesions, you don't have to perform a biopsy. The advantages of this test is that it rules out melanoma in the majority of the cases. Biopsies aren't required. You don't need to use your knives or make any incisions. And patients can get multiple biopsies over a lifetime, which are disfiguring, so this can forego you doing the biopsy. You don't need the local anesthetic. Uh, and you can follow these lesions longitudinally. If you biopsy one or if you do the adhesive patch on one and it's not cancer, you can continue to follow it. And if it does turn into cancer or you get concerned later on, you can, buy, you can test it again. The disadvantage of this test is that if melanoma is a, bio, is, is a possibility, you still need to perform the biopsy. And now there's a, sig a significant cost increase to that patient. You not only have to order a genomic test, now you've got to also do the biopsy. So for that patient, you've increased the cost, but in the vast majority of patients, you're not going to see that. There is a low positive predictive value for melanoma at about 19 to 20 percent. Uh, but if you're looking for atypia, this is increased, uh, but still need to do a biopsy of the lesion if you're looking for something more advanced. If you do a biopsy and it's negative, well, you've removed that incident lesion. That future risk of that turning into melanoma is now gone. But with a pigmented lesion assay, that's not the case. You'd have to follow that lesion over time to make sure it doesn't change. Uh, and hopefully the patient does get doesn't get lost to follow up and they come back with now metastatic disease. And if you are going to do repeat testing on those lesions, that does increase cost. Per the company, there are areas where you cannot use this test. Um, in the background of eczema or psoriasis or in a previously biopsied area with residual scar. Small lesions or very large lesions are not appropriate for this test. And as you would expect, on the palms and soles, you're really not going to lift up much uh, genomic tissue from pigmented lesions. Uh, you can't use an adhesive strip on mucous membranes. And under nails, you're just not going to get any pigmentation or any pigmented lesions as well. Uh, they say you should not use this for ulcerated or bleeding lesions, but I would offer why would you? Um, if you have an ulcerated or bleeding lesion, you should probably just biopsy it anyway. And it's not recommended for patients under 18 years of age. I think that's just because it wasn't a cohort that was looked at. I don't have any more reason for that, but I think they just didn't do their uh, trials uh, with kids. All right, so let's say you've performed the biopsy. Okay, you've it raised to your level of suspicion, so you performed the biopsy. Now what? Well, over 2 million biopsies are performed a year for suspected melanoma, but only about 130,000 are going to be diagnosed with melanoma and another 90,000 with melanoma in situ. And then there's approximately 300,000 lesions that are biopsied that a dermatopathologist looks at and says, not sure. The typical pathway for a dermatopathologist would be to get the lesion, perform H&E uh, staining, and if still not sure, then immunohistochemistry for certain markers. And that's historically. But now there's gene expression profiling that can be utilized for those difficult to determine lesions. The first S assay that we're going to talk about is the MyPath assay. Uh, my path assay. Uh, per the company, it's an objective and comprehensive diagnostic offering to aid derm paths in characterizing difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesion. That one that I always hate that comes to me that AMNUS, that atypical melanocytic neoplasm of uncertain significance. What do you do with that? Uh, spitzoid melanoma versus spitz nevi, uh, congenital nevi versus melanoma. So it helps in kind of swaying the, uh, the pendulum to making a diagnosis of malignancy or not. This is a 23-gene assay uh, using quantitative RT-PCR, so it's off DNA, and this is very stable, and it provides an accurate and objective classification that will either give benign, intermediate, or malignant. And it distinguishes melanoma from benign nevi with, with, with high accuracy. But even after my path, there are still many lesions that are indeterminate, and then it defaults to the DIF-DX uh, uh, assay. And this is a 35-gene expression profile test for the ones that you weren't able to classify under the MyPath, and this now increases sensitivity and specificity to greater than 
Both assays are owned by Castle Biosciences and they will run these in sequence. So if the MyPath is inconclusive, they will then defer to the DIFDX, although you can order one over the other if you so choose. Uh, there are clinically actionable results from this with more than 77% from the MyPath alone and then in combination greater than 99%. Sometimes you'd still get an indeterminate result and it'll be reported as such and then you just have to have that discussion with your patient, what should we do? The advantages of this test, well, you're looking at the biologic determinant of malignant or benign potential. You're not just looking at it under a microscope to say, oh, I think this is aggressive, you can't do that. But now you have the biology to help make that decision. It allows for classification of most tumors, and it avoids over-treatment of those low-risk tumors, the benign tumors that don't need further excisions, and it supports the treatment of the more aggressive tumors. The disadvantages are maybe it's just easier to remove the lesion if you don't know what it is. You've already done the biopsy, there's a scar there. Perhaps you just go ahead and remove the lesion. Now you're increasing the cost of the system because potentially you're running two assays uh, and still need to do the biopsy on the lesion as opposed to just the biopsy alone. And you can still have an indeterminate result. For both of these companies or both of these uh, tests actually are supported by NCCN guidelines. And if you look at the detection for the adhesive patch test on the second uh, dot here, it says pre-diagnostic non-invasive genomic patch testing may also be helpful to guide biopsy decisions. And then for diagnosis uh, with the gene expression profiling, which is the ancillary tests that are being referred to, they may facilitate interpretation of cases that are diagnostically uncertain. So it's that the fact that they're in the NCCN guidelines, they're covered by Medicare, uh, I, I think this is important to know. All right, so that's for the diagnosis portion. We're now going to move on to looking at prognosis. Well, let's first identify what's the gold standard for uh, prognosis for non-molecular tools. Well, that's AJCC staging. I'm sure all of you are familiar with AJCC staging. It looks at the extent of the primary tumor and the magnitude of the spread within the body of that tumor. And that's based on the TNM staging. T for tumor, depth of the tumor for melanoma by millimeter. N is for lymph nodes and M metastases. And it's category and cancer specific. So TNM for melanoma isn't the same as TNM for, say, colorectal cancer. And then when you take the TNM, you have to put it into a stage. And the stage is a combination of those three components along with cancer specific prognostic factors. For melanoma, we know ulceration will upstage a lesion, also with lymphovascular invasion and even uh, mitotic rape. And stage is a key factor that defines prognosis as well as defining appropriate treatment for specific cancers, and in this case, melanoma. I'm not going to go over this in detail, but this is the AJCC staging, the most recent eighth edition that came out uh, that actually looks at the T stage on the top left, uh, going over what makes something T1 to T4, and then A and B with ulceration. Uh, then you have the N stage, N1 to 3 for N1 for microscopic disease from a sentinel lymph node, to N3 for matted lymph nodes or microsatellites within the biopsy specimen. And then metastasis goes from M1A to M1D. M1A is just in other lymph node basins or skin or subcutaneous tissue versus M1D, which is the most severe, which is brain metastases. And it breaks it all down if you ever want to look at it and understand it a little bit better. So why do we stage? Well, we need to recognize the stage of tumor before we commence treatment. You first have to identify the lesion in question. Patient walks in, they have this lesion. Well, is it cancer or not? Again, use the ABCDEs, potentially dermoscopy or reflective confocal microscopy, and then ultimately a pigmented lesion assay or gene expression profiling. Well, you now feel it's tumor, so you're going to do a biopsy or obtain tissue from it, and it shows it's melanoma. You've made the diagnosis. Now you have to tailor your treatment based on the depth of the lesion. If it's a 0.3 millimeter melanoma, you're just going to excise it. However, if it's, say, a 2 millimeter melanoma, the patient now needs to have further staging with a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then if the sentinel lymph node biopsy is positive or if the patient has clinical palpable disease, they now have at least stage three melanoma. And before you can say they have stage three, you have to rule out stage four. So you need to do cross-sectional imaging uh, to make sure they don't have metastatic disease. And if they do have metastatic disease, then you would place them on systemic therapy. So it's important to know the stage to know where your patient's gonna fall in here and what you're gonna do for them. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, defining prognosis allows us to make these spa stage specific treatments. Because if you don't use stage, if you have a patient who has a two millimeter melanoma, you biopsy it and you say, oh, you have early stage disease, 
and you just excise the melanoma and you haven't sent them for a sentinel lymph node biopsy, they could still have occult stage three disease that you don't know and now you're under treating a patient. So we have to understand the stage. But staging is incomplete. It defines factors that are seen under the microscope or seen radiographically on CAT scans or PET scans. It doesn't include the biologic determinants of aggressiveness. We don't look at driving mutations, uh, BRAF, NRAS. You don't look at the gene expression profile, receptor characterizations with PD-1 uh, or any other factors. And what's important and what we really want to know is a patient walks into your office with this. What's the likelihood they're going to have a lymph node involvement? Or even worse, what's the likelihood that this tumor after you treat it is going to show up with a PET scan like this? And this is a PET scan for those of you who haven't seen one. The big black spots are the heart and the bladder. All the small black spots are metastatic disease. And you want to try to identify which patients may turn into the one with the lymph node or the one with metastatic disease. And if you knew that ahead of time, perhaps you'd treat them differently. Just to run through some melanoma statistics, I see that there weren't many melanoma talks today, so I don't think this will bore you too much, or not today for the whole weekend. Uh, melanoma accounts for less than 5% of all cancer cases. Deaths from melanoma, however, account for more than 70% of deaths from all skin tumors. Uh, in some countries, melanoma is actually the main cause of cancer in the young cohort from 25 to 29, and it's the second most common cause, uh, second most common cancer after breast cancer, causing deaths in women in the cohort of 30 to 35. Historically, we said melanoma was a disease of old people. Well, it's not. It's not just a disease of elderly. We know that our young people are using tanning beds and they're getting abnormal amounts of ultraviolet radiation. I'm sure these people who are sitting out at the pool out here, or if you uh, lived in Arizona, you went tubing down the Salt River, you got blistering sunburns, you just increase your risk for getting melanoma upwards to eight times just from that blistering sunburn. And we're seeing these patients that present to both you and then ultimately to me earlier, younger, with significant and severe disease. The American Cancer Society estimates that there'll be about 100,000 new cases of melanoma this year and approximately 8,000 deaths from melanoma. So this is a significant health risk, and I think we need to address it a little bit better than we actually are. If you look at how patients present, this is kind of what you see. You know this. This isn't going to be any surprise. Most patients present with early stage disease or what they call localized here. This is a study from the SEER database and they call it localized, which is confined to the primary site, so stage one or stage two. A smaller volume are gonna have lymph node disease, and then even a smaller volume are gonna have metastatic disease at the time of presentation. Now, this is retrospective, and there are some patients who didn't have uh, their stages uh, put into the database, so that's why it states unknown. But if you look at the survival of these patients, if patients have localized disease, according to this, their overall, or their five-year melanoma-specific survival is greater than 99%. These patients are going to be cured. If they have regional disease, their survival drops down to 70%. And if they have metastatic disease, it drops down to 30%. I caution you on this data, however, because for the localized disease, melanoma in situ is included. And if you understand melanoma in situ, by definition, it has zero risk of spread, has zero risk of death. And so that's inflating these numbers uh, a little bit. And I would say true to life numbers for local disease with stage one and stage two is going to be lower than this. On the flip side, we now have immunotherapy, and immunotherapy and even targeted therapy has been shown to work wonders for melanoma beyond what we usually had with just interferon. And the survival now for regional disease is probably upwards to 85% five year with nodal disease and upwards to 50 to 60% now with metastatic disease. So we're making great inroads, understanding the immune milieu of these tumors as well as the uh, genetic drivers, such as the BRAF mutation. Looking at this a little bit differently, I'm going to kind of twist numbers on you here. So I want to look at stage of diagnosis, but we're going to take out stage four. If you take out stage four and look to see, well, what patients are presenting, how do they present at stage of diagnosis, as you would expect, the vast majority are going to be early stage, with 80% being stage one, and another 12% at stage two, and a smaller proportion uh, with stage three. But if you look at melanoma deaths, people who died of melanoma, what was the stage that they initially presented at? Of all the deaths of melanoma for this study, 26% 26 actually presented with stage one disease. These are patients you would have said, you're cured, you don't need anything else. But if you go back to the deaths and follow it back to when they first showed up, 
quarter, per, quarter of patients are showing up with stage one, third of patients are showing up with stage two disease at the onset, and then more with stage three. We exclude stage four because that would actually take over uh, the, the deaths from, from this, but I think it's important to see that it's not inconsequential when patients are actually showing up with early disease because they can recur and die. We know that many high-risk tumors are being misidentified as low-risk tumors at the time of diagnosis because early tumors, one millimeter tumors can recur later in life as I've just stated. So we need to improve prognostic accuracy. And AJCC staging is incomplete. Can we figure out how to do this better? A clinical question that we need to address. Are we under-treating patients or are we over-treating patients? Well, I'd offer that we're doing both. We're under-treating patients because some pages with early melanoma are gonna recur. Maybe we should have considered a sentinel lymph node biopsy on that 0.7 millimeter melanoma. Or maybe we should have put this patient into intensive surveillance or even pharmacologic therapies now that we know that there's therapies approved for stage two melanoma in the adjuvant setting. Are we overtreating our patients? Well, yeah, because many patients with thicker tumors never recur. So did we really need to perform the sentinel lymph node biopsy on them? Could we have dropped down their, their surveillance to low intensity? And maybe they didn't need all that cross-sectional imaging and getting all those CT scans. Maybe molecular tests can better inform how we treat our patients. These are the tests that are out there right now for prognostic tests, uh, either that are available or in production. There's an eight gene expression profile test by a company called Nelicare, that's called Melogenics, and this is a German company. Uh, there's Skyline DX for melanoma. And this is currently in development with Mayo Clinic, amongst others, <coughs> excuse me. There's a 31 gene expression profile test called Decision DX for melanoma by Castle Biosciences. And then Signatera test, which is actually looking at circulating tumor DNA in the blood, and that's by a company called Natera. And we're gonna run over through these real quickly just so you can see what's out there. The Melogenics from Nelicare, as I said, it's an eight gene expression profile assay. And this one is designed to determine the risk of relapse for early stage disease, as well as potentially guide treatment options for patients with stage three or nodal disease. Um, it is covered by some private insurers in Germany. It just has not made it to the United States. Um, there has been one test that I, or one paper that I saw where it was validated in a German study and it discriminates between high and intermediate risk for stage two cutaneous melanoma uh, for those patients who may uh, require adjuvant immunotherapy or not. Uh, as they work further and further and get more patients, uh, they may be able to expand their indications. The Skyline DX for melanoma, I think this is gonna be the next big company that you're gonna see over the next couple years. Uh, this is a Netherlands company, but instead of just staying within Europe, they're actually partnering with institutions in the United States, including Mayo Clinic, Moffitt Cancer Center, amongst others. They have multiple tests, and we'll look at those. The first one is the Merlin test. It's a gene panel that predicts the risk of a sentinel lymph node positive, positivity. It's able to calculate risk based on a combination of eight genes from the patient's primary tumor, as well as the tumor thickness and the patient's age to personalize that risk. And it can predict nodal metastatic disease or risk as low or high. The question that they're asking is, can a patient safely forego a sentinel lymph node biopsy? Perhaps they can, and we know this is an important question because only approximately 15% of sentinel lymph node biopsies that we perform are positive. Uh, so maybe we can help identify that 85% who may not need a sentinel lymph node biopsy. This company also has other initiatives that they're looking at. Uh, one's called the Peregrine Initiative, which is looking at high risk of recurrence, uh, looking at the individual risk profile uh, in those patients who are sentinel lymph node negative to see if they're high or low risk of actually recurring in the future. Their Kestrel is looking at thin melanomas that may be at risk for melanomas, uh, for, for metastatic disease. Because we do know that when patients recur, they don't always recur in their lymph nodes. They can bypass the lymph nodes and go directly to the lungs or wherever. So maybe there is a genomic uh, signature that can predict that. They're also looking at squamous cell carcinoma risk of metastasis as well. These are in earlier phase studies. Uh, this is not ready for prime time yet, but I would expect, as I said, probably 2024 that you're going to start hearing about this. And I'm interested to see what they have to offer. This is a new and exciting field, the, what the Signatera, what this company, Natera, is doing. Uh, this is actually taking blood and looking to see if they can identify cancer DNA within the blood. And if you can detect that, well, that means something completely different. 
If you can achieve clearance of cancer DNA within your blood at any point during treatment with someone who has metastatic disease, well, that's associated with a favorable prognosis, as you would expect. If someone has disease in their blood and it goes away, well, that patient should probably do better. You could also use it for someone who has stage three disease. So if they get a lymph node and you take it out and you follow them and now you start to see circulating tumor DNA in the blood, perhaps that patient is now gonna recur and you can know this ahead of time. And we talked about the, uh, if they do clear their blood from uh, stage four, it may show that they're having a good response to treatment. This is still in development for melanoma. It is approved for colon cancer and bladder cancer. Uh, there is a clinical benefit because there's a lead time benefit. They've actually shown that you can identify DNA in the blood three months before you would ever see anything on a scan. So if you're gonna be following a patient for melanoma, maybe it comes to you guys to order this test and monitor them and then if they do end up having elevations in their circulating tumor DNA, you can then refer them to medical oncology. Uh, so I think this may be an important part of your armamentarium in terms of following your patients with melanoma. All right, finally, Decision DX for melanoma. Again, I do talk for this company and I was asked to give this talk to see how I use this and how I incorporate it into my practice. So we're gonna go a little bit more in depth with this company. This is the only one that's in clinical use at this time. Uh, so there's a lot more data uh, and a lot more use with this. So Castle asked, wanted to ask two questions. A patient shows up with a localized cutaneous melanoma. What's the risk of recurrence? And traditionally, you use the clinical pathologic features such as tumor thickness, the T-stage, ulceration, and even the sentinel lymph node biopsy status. They also wanted to ask, well, what's the risk of a positive sentinel lymph node? Instead of just looking at tumor thickness and ulceration, is there something with the genomic expression that can classify these patients at high risk or low risk? Well, for recurrence, if they're assumed lower risk, then you're going to change your treatment in terms of what you do for them. You'll put them in low risk uh, follow-up, low intensity, no advanced imaging. If they're high risk, you're gonna do a whole lot more in terms of uh, following them with scans, potentially consider them for treatment and possibly uh, enrollment into a clinical trial. We'll look at the risk of recurrence first. So a patient shows up with a stage one to three melanoma and it's important that it's for stage one to three, it's not for melanoma in situ. As I said, by definition, melanoma in situ has zero risk of spread, so you don't need to know what the risk of recurrence is for that. And this is not meant for anybody with metastatic disease because they've already spread and you don't need to know what their risk is for that. It's a 31 gene expression profile uh, using RT-PCR. They have a validated algorithm and it predicts high risk or low risk of recurrence. I guess many of you have used this test before and you've seen the outcomes that come out as a class one. It used to be just class one and class two. Then it was broken down to class 1A for the low, low risk, class 2B for the high, high risk, and then the 1B, 2A for that intermediate risk. I am gonna show you some survival curves and I won't get too much into this because I know this gets really boring, um, but I think this is important to understand how this test initially came to light and what it uses. If you look at the, the curve on the right, we're gonna be talking about RFS, which is recurrence free survival and recurrence is either locally at the site of excision or in the lymph nodes, and then DMFS, which is distant metastasis-free survival anywhere beyond the lymph nodes. So if we look at recurrence-free survival for this study, all comers, that's that black line. And it said the five-year recurrence-free survival was 72%. I, I would say that's probably a little bit lower than what I would expect, but this, in this trial, they picked out some more aggressive patients uh, for this. Uh, and then the CASEL test was run on these tumors and you can see for the blue line, which is the class 1A, the, the lowest of low risk, that the five-year recurrence-free survival, the likelihood that these patients are gonna occur, drops down to 13% from 28%. And if they have a 2B signature, the aggressive profile, their risk of recurrence now is over 50%. So you're identifying patients based on their biology. This is, tumor, this is stage agnostic. It doesn't matter what their T stage is in this, um, except because they had to have sentinel lymph nodes that were negative. It wasn't stage three, this is just stage one and stage two. So it didn't really matter what their T-stage was, but if they had a high-risk tumor, they would fall into the red line and you can see how those survivals go down. Same thing you can see for the distant metastasis-free survival, just on a narrower uh, plane, as you would expect, it takes longer for patients to, uh, to develop distant metastases. Well, that's great, that's stage one and stage two. We know patients with stage two disease are much more aggressive. Melanoma, patients with stage two C melanoma actually do worse than patients with stage three A disease. So stage 2C, we know they're gonna do bad. Maybe that's what you're picking up as all the stage two patients that are falling into that, into that red line, into the 2B. 
So the question was asked, what about thin tumors? What about tumors that are, I guess I gotta hit the right button there, um, less than or equal to one millimeter. So we're looking at the thin ones. The ones are, these are the patients, you said, oh, you're cured, go away, I don't need to see you back until you come back for your, your normal follow-up. But it turns out, even for those patients that have a less than or equal to one millimeter depth of tumor, those curves do separate. If you can identify someone with a 1A signature, they're gonna do great. Their five-year recurrence-free survival is 97%, but if they have a 2B signature, their five-year recurrence-free survival drops down to 65%. So 35% of these patients are recurring. Now that's not insignificant. This is in the best of the best actors from a T-stage standpoint. But I do want you to look at this table on the right. I want you to look at the N, okay? How many patients are actually showing up with stage 2B who have thin melanomas? Well, there's 15, 15 out of 260. It's not that much. So should this test be performed on everybody who has a less than one millimeter melanoma? I would say no. I would say your hit rate's gonna be pretty low. This incorporates all patients from 0.3 to one millimeter. And Castle will tell you that this test is indicated for patients with melanomas at 0.3 and thicker. And that, that's actually true because they have found 2B signatures within patients who have 0.3 millimeter melanomas. But the number of patients that actually have a 0.3 millimeter melanoma and a 2B signature, it's gonna be tiny. So is it worth doing all these tests to find those patients? For me, I think that's not appropriate. I think we're over-treating and over-testing and when we have to worry about cost containment, I think that's doing the wrong thing. I don't use it for these thin tumors. It's personal for you if you decide it's the right thing to do or for that patient, I'm not gonna say don't do it. Um, it is a it is approved for that. I do it for patients who are probably at about 0.6 um, or deeper, and depending, I may even push it more depending on the patient. Um, at 0.8, I do it for everybody if they have a sentinel lymph node, but for the, the thinner ones, it's case by case basis, but I don't do it for the 0.3s or 0.4s. I think you're, the, the likelihood you're gonna find something is so small, and the benefit that you're giving the patients is, is probably not there. They've done multiple tests, they being Castle. They've had uh, archival tests and retrospective studies. They've had prospective studies that were performed by physicians who weren't involved with Castle. And you see a lot of consistency across the gamut showing that this test has been well vetted. Uh, there's been a lot of studies looking at it, a lot of validation, and even how it changes in, in, in clinical management. Uh, so I do think that this is a good test for what it needs to be used for. But when we look at the class one and the class two, as I told you before, that was T-stage agnostic. It didn't really matter what stage you had, stage one or stage two. And that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. When I would give this talk and I would say, oh yeah, a patient, if they have a class two signature, they're gonna do worse. But if somebody who has a two millimeter class two signature and someone has a four millimeter class two signature, are they equal? Probably not. That four millimeter one with the class two is probably gonna be more likely to recur. And I think Castle understood that, so they started to integrate personal factors into their test, and that's now their newest test, or the new version of their test is called the I-31 ROR, or for risk of recurrence, and this involves uh, personal or patient-specific clinical pathologic features. So you have that 31 gene expression score, which gives you your class. They then combined it with these clinical factors, thickness, ulceration, mitotic rate, the sentinel node status, age, and tumor location, and this was all defined on artificial intelligence, uh, validated based neural network, uh, just stuff well beyond my comprehension. Uh, and they were able to come up with the I-31 ROR. And this has been great to deal with patients and to talk to patients about because it's much more patient specific, individual specific. And this is what the report looks like. Um, we'll blow this up a little bit. This is the top of the report. And the example that's given here is this is a patient who has a 0.5 millimeter melanoma they're 68, that used to be old to me, not as old anymore. Uh, they did not have ulceration. Um, it was a head and neck, so maybe a little bit higher risk there. Uh, lymph node status was not known because they didn't do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and the mitotic rate was zero. So this looks to be a low risk clinical pathologically. A decision DX test was performed, which showed this to be a class 1A. I'd be honest with you, I probably wouldn't have done this test on this patient. Uh, they hadn't really have that many concerning features that I would even perform it. Uh, but it was, and as you would expect, this was a class 1A. So what's their risk of recurrence? Well, based on all those factors, the validated algorithm can actually pinpoint what the risk of recurrence is, looking at recurrence-free survival, 
distant metastasis free survival and melanoma specific survival. And you can have an honest conversation with your patients for this. Hey, your risk of recurrence is approximately 5%. Are we going to do all this major stuff for you? Well, 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 probably not. Why do I want to put you through the ringer for this uh, when we know your risk of recurring is so low? And look, you're 99% chance you're cured of this thing. And I think you, you can take this information and make your patients feel a whole lot better. On the flip side, if you get those results to say, oh, your, recurrent, your risk of recurrence is now 50%, well, now you can have an honest conversation with your patient as well and say, well, we're going to keep a close eye on you. This doesn't mean you are going to recur. It means your risk is increased, and we want to find it early because we think that finding disease early is beneficial because now we can treat you early. And this is for the just stage one or stage two. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and look at looking, looking at the risk of having a positive sentinel lymph node. And just like we've, they've individualized the risk of recurrence based on the class, they've now also done this with the risk of having a positive lymph node. So we have to understand a little bit of how I select or how we select patients for performing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. I think you all understand that anybody who has a tumor that's 0.8 millimeters or thicker, they should undergo a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Well, why 0.8? Because that's where about a 5% risk of having a positive sentinel lymph node is. And we know if we use 0.8, the risk of them having a positive sentinel lymph node for anything deeper is approximately 12 to 15%. If they have tumors that are deeper than 0.8, um, say with a T1B uh, tumor, their risk is now increased about 5 to 10 percent. And if they have tumors that are 2 millimeters or greater, their risk is going to be over 10 percent. And so this is just talking about when you should consider or offer sentinel lymph node biopsy. But we know for all comers, for patients that I do sentinel lymph node biopsies for, my positive rate is about 15 percent. That means I'm doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy on a ton of patients who get no clinical benefit from it. 85 percent of the patients I do this to are going to have negative sentinel lymph nodes. Now, you can't underplay the importance of a negative test. Patients walk away knowing that their cancer has not spread to their lymph nodes has a lot of power. But still, I would say we are probably doing way too many of these for our patient benefit. So is there a way to maybe figure this out looking at the biology of their cancer? And that's where this comes into play. So it takes the 31 gene expression score. It now combines these clinical pathologic factors, Breslow thickness, ulceration, mitotic rate, and age. And I think his age is really important because you've seen your patients who are 70 or 80 and have been out in the sun, they have this leathery skin, versus someone who has, who's 30-year-old has really supple skin. The lymphatics are much more robust in a 30-year-old than they are going to be in a 70-year-old. So age is a big determinant uh, that shows up in this assay. And if you look at how the outcomes are written for this, you're actually going to get a percentage taking all that together as it gets applied into that algorithm to say, this is your risk of having a positive sentinel lymph node. This goes back to the patient who had the 0.5 millimeter melanoma on the head and neck, and as you would expect, their risk of having a positive lymph node is so low, you wouldn't even offer this. And I wouldn't have run this test for this patient, okay? And I'll show you when I would run this test. But you can also see if this lymph node was positive. So if you did the sentinel lymph node on this patient, and it was positive where they had the microscopic stage three disease, these would be their recurrences, where the recurrence-free survival would be 82% over five years, and the risk of actually dying, even though there's melanoma in their lymph nodes, is only about 3 to 4%. And I think this is important information to have and for you to discuss with patients. So that's kind of the essence of Decision DX, uh, what Castle has now done. And I want to show you how I incorporate that into my practice. Okay, first we're going to look at depth of tumor. So any patients who have thin tumors less than 0.8, I don't usually offer them a sentinel lymph node biopsy unless they have factors that may want to sway me. One of that is that transected base. Oh, I see that all the time. This patient has a 0.7, but it's a transected base. Um, should we do the sentinel lymph node biopsy? It's a discussion with the patient. Maybe, maybe not, because a lot of times when you go back and re-resect the tumor specimen, there's nothing there. And then you've, they only have a 0.7 millimeter tumor. Um, if the tumor has a high mitotic rate um, or if the patient's young, I will consider doing this test to see what is their risk of having a positive sentinel lymph node. If it's less than 5%, they don't need it. We'll just do the excision. If it's greater than 5%, we're going to offer a sentinel lymph node biopsy, or I'm going to offer a sentinel lymph node biopsy. If their tumors are greater than equal to 0.8, everybody should get a sentinel lymph node biopsy, I feel. That's gold standard. That's been tried and true, and I'm okay with doing this 
uh, being a little bit more aggressive on the sentinel lymph node biopsy side, A, for that risk of getting a negative result where you can confirm to the patient that they don't have disease, uh, plus that's still standard of care. And if I deviate away from that, I think uh, we're not quite at a point in the surgical society to say we're not going to do it. But if they're poor operative candidates or maybe they don't, they're not sure they want to have a sentinel lymph node, this is a great test to look at and say, well, let's see what your risk is. And if their risk is less than 5%, you say, great. I don't need to do it. I just had an 80-year-old who had a 1.2 millimeter melanoma. He was on oxygen. I was like, I don't really want to do this to you. And his risk was 3.9%. Uh, so I could say, look, we don't have to do this. So he was pleased and I was pleased as well. Um, and then if it is above 5%, then we would consider doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Any tumor that shows, any tumor, any patient that shows up with a tumor greater than four millimeters, I'm actually doing a PET scan at the onset uh, for the risk of having metastatic disease. Now, NCCN guidelines don't support this, but I've seen enough where I've done a pet, enough PET scans and I've found metastatic disease in enough patients that I think it's beneficial for the patient for me to understand if they have metastatic disease before I'm gonna start going into their armpit or their groin. Uh, even though it's a small procedure, it still is a procedure. If their PET scans don't show any disease, then I'm gonna take them for a wide local excision and sentinel lymph node biopsy because you can't see microscopic disease on a PET scan. If they have a positive sentinel lymph node, I refer them to medical oncology hands down so I do not perform this test because it doesn't change what I do. I'm gonna send them to the medical oncologist anyway and they can have that discussion. And if I discuss with the medical oncologist, well maybe somebody doesn't wanna have immunotherapy, well then maybe that's the time to order the test, but I don't think it's for me to make that decision. But if their sentinel lymph node biopsy is negative, I'm ordering this on everybody, because we know they're getting, they have a tumor that's at least 0 0.8 millimeters, and I wanna see what their risk of recurrence is. All right, so now we're gonna look at how I manage it based on the class, if it's class 1A. Um, if it's less than a millimeter, I'm discharging them back to dermatology. I don't need to see these patients. Now, I want you to understand that even while I am seeing these patients, they should still be seeing you as well. I mandate that all my patients follow up with dermatology because I'm not a dermatologist and I'm not there to look at everything that they have. If they have a tumor that's greater than one millimeter and they have a class 1A, well, I will offer follow-up, but it's only clinical. I will do clinical exams every four months in the first year and every six months in the second year, looking at their skin, looking at their scars, feeling their lymph nodes, seeing if they have any clinical evidence of recurrence. The class 1Bs and 2As, I think this, this uh, test helps now because they're predicting or they're showing the recurrences on an individual level. So it's based on that individual risk of recurrence and I'll usually order an annual CT scan for the 1Bs and then in the intervening four months I'll get chest x-rays. And if it's a class 2A, I'll alternate CT scans and chest x-rays. And ultimately if somebody has a class 2B signature, I'm getting chest scans uh, every four months. Now you're gonna say, well what if their disease is on their legs? Depends on body habitus. If they're skinny, I can just feel their groins to see if they have lymph nodes. If they're heavy, then I'm gonna be getting an ultrasound to stage uh, the nodes in their, uh, in their groin. Most patients, if they're gonna spread, they spread to the lungs. Rarely do you see something in the liver, but hopefully even with a chest CT scan, you can still cut it off in the liver. Uh, I'm not seeing bowel metastases. It's so rare that I don't need to do abdominal imaging. So that's how I manage patients with this test. Majority of my patients are class 1As, as you would expect. Um, and this allows me to actually de-escalate care for these patients. So I think I'm actually saving society a lot of money by ordering this test because I'm not following them with scans every four months. I'm saying, oh, all you need is a clinical examination or just go back to your dermatology. You don't need my services uh, to continue on with the care. All right, so in conclusion, the current management for melanoma is you perform a biopsy to make your diagnosis. You stage the patient surgically with a sentinel lymph node biopsy, radiographically with scans. You then put them through treatment depending on what stage they are, anywhere from observation to immunotherapy to even resecting metastatic disease, and then following them up months, years, depending on their risk. Managing melanoma now uh, using molecular diagnostics and prognostics. Well, if you think it's melanoma and you don't want to do a biopsy, you can use the pigmented lesion assay and assess the genomics to see if there's a risk of dysplasia or malignancy. If it's an indeterminate lesion, then do the MyPath diff the X to see, well, is this going to be cancer or not, and manage the patient appropriately. If it's melanoma, you want to know, how do I need to stage them? Do I need to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy? Well, you've now got the Skyline DX and the Decision DX test, uh, ultimately the Skyline DX and now the Decision DX test. Uh, to assess the risk of a positive sentinel lymph node. 
for surveillance, that risk of recurrence, the Decision DX, ultimately the Skyline DX, and the Melogenics will be available to uh, look at the genomic expression profile to assess low or high risk, and then order uh, radiographs or follow them clinically. And then treatment based on the uh, clinical pathologic features and molecular features. If somebody has obvious palpable disease, you know what to do with it. If they have metastatic disease and you're treating them, you can follow them. We're looking at their circulating tumor DNA from Natera. And then follow up with what you decide. Future possibilities, it's my presumption that a patient's gonna come to you and you're gonna manage them completely. You're gonna get that tissue, however you decide to get that tissue, and you're gonna know, is it malignant? Does surgery even need to be done? Are they at risk of having a nodal spread? What's the risk of this coming back or even spreading? And if it is, are they gonna respond to treatment? So it's ultimately gonna be up to you guys to tell everybody, and I'm just gonna sit back and wait for them to show up as you say, oh, this patient is a high risk, I don't have to think anymore. So we're gonna shift all that onto you, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> uh, that's my talk. Um, I hope this was informative. Again, I blew through a lot of things, so if you have questions, uh, this is my email address, or I can talk to you later. Again, there is the Derm Tech and Castle Biosciences. They do have a booth here if there's further questions that I can't answer for you. Thank you for your time and thank you to the Dermatology Education Foundation again for letting me give this talk.